Sonder, noun. You are the main character, the protagonist, the star at the center of your own unfolding story. You're surrounded by your supporting cast, friends and family hanging in your immediate orbit. Scattered a little further out, uh, a network of acquaintances who drift in and out of contact over the years. But there in the background, faint and out of focus, are the extras, the random passers-by, each living a life as vivid and complex as your own. They carry on invisibly around you, bearing the accumulated weight of their own ambitions, friends, worries, mistakes, triumphs, and inherited craziness. And when your life moves on to the next scene, theirs flickers in place, surrounded by their own backstory and inside jokes and, and characters from a thousand other stories that you'll never be able to see, that you'll never know exists, in which you might appear only once, as an extra sipping coffee in the background, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. That is Sonder. Now, you may not have heard of this word before today. Um, it's from the French uh, for to plumb the depths. Um, I, I can't tell you if it's a real word or not, but I can tell you that, um, I'll leave that up to you, but I can tell you that I did make it up four years ago uh, in the middle of the night. Um, I am the creator of the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, whose mission is to fill all the holes left in the language of emotion and, uh, and give names to experiences that we all have but we don't usually talk about because we, we don't have the words to do it. Um, it's, I started it seven years ago and I haven't been able to stop. I don't know if I will be able to stop. It has become something of an obsession, um, but I, I find it tremendously uh, fulfilling and I'm not even really sure why. Um, I do know that when I was around eight or nine, I used to, uh, we had just moved overseas, my family, and I would read the dictionary for fun. As you can imagine, I, I didn't have a whole lot of friends back then, but, um, but I, I found the experience somehow comforting. I think there was something about being the middle child where it's kind of a book of consensus, you know, where this is basically a list of what we can at least agree upon. But it's also a glimpse at a wider world because you kind of get the feeling that somewhere in these pages you could find yourself somewhere. That you could find a word that defines you, that contains you in a way, that, and that container could have a handle that you could pass on to someone else. So that your own experience becomes a shared experience and make you feel less alone. But the more you read the dictionary, the more you begin to question why we have certain words for some things and not other things. Um, we don't usually question that because we usually don't have much choice in the matter. We, the words that we use to build our lives from are mostly handed, handed to us in, in the crib. Um, and so if your parents handed you the colors uh, for green and blue, for example, um, those are the lenses that you're going to use to look at the world. Um, but if you happen to speak uh, Vietnamese or Xhosa or one of these other languages all around the world that don't distinguish between green and blue, then you're not going to see the world that way. Just like in English, we don't distinguish between uh, light blue and dark blue. We just consider them shades of the same color, but Russians do have different words for that. And so you can only imagine with, with emotions how much we're missing because we don't have very many shades of the blues. And, but the words we do have are very much a product of their time, um, that, which is why we end up words, with words like hagiography, which is the study of the lives of saints, or defenestration, which is where you throw someone out a window, or my favorite, which is shuck. It's the act of peeling corn. We have a word for that. But for all that, the, the, the exterior world, the wilderness, is, has been tamed and civilized. It has been exhaustively richly detailed, but the interior wilderness, for whatever reason, is still mostly unexplored territory. And it's kind of a, a mystery as to why that should be. I think we mostly think of our emotions as somehow untranslatable. But I don't think that's actually true. I think that's just the language as we've inherited it. And so I've tried to fix that with the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. 
That's what I've been working on. And I'll give you some examples of the kind of words that I do. One is opia, that's from Greek, uh, and that is the, um, the ambiguous intensity of looking someone in the eye. You know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a strange mixture of vulnerability and invasiveness, where their pupils are glittering black, bottomless and opaque, all at the same time. As if you're standing in front of a door and you're looking through the keyhole. You can tell that there's someone standing on the other side, but you can't tell if you're looking in or you're looking out. Opia is from uh, the Greek word for eyes, as in ophthalmology, uh, as well as uh, opia as in the plural of, plural of opium. It's the opiate of the eyes. Uh, and then there's vemadalin, which is the frustration of taking photos of something uh, when thousands of identical photos already exist. We run into this all the time, where we, we have the close-up of the eye covered. That, that one angle of the Taj Mahal Someone has taken that angle before. Um, and so it, it, takes, it, it turns something, uh, what had been a unique subject, into something hollow and pulpy and cheap. Uh, and so that's Vaimandalan. And finally, onism, which is the awareness of how much of the world that you'll never get to see because you are trapped basically in one body, in just one place at a time. So everything that you will never experience. So it's like you're standing in front of a departure screen at air, in an airport just flickering over with exotic place names like other people's passwords. Each a reminder of something that you'll never get to see before you die only because, as the arrow on the map helpfully points out, you are here. And then, finally, Sonder. Uh, the realization that each of us is the main character in our own story. Um, I would say that Sonder isn't just, it's, it's more than a mood, it, it is a challenge and it, it is a curse because I feel it right now actually because you, you are a faceless audience and I am a stranger, I am an, basically to you an extra. And so that is our relationship, but I, if, if I actually am present in the room and I search one of your faces, I could probably find some glimmer of a story, some some sense of humanity, of your agency, of something deeper there. And maybe I'd, I'd get it in just a little flash. And that's pretty much how Sonder happens today. It's just a couple seconds while people, people watching and then you move on with your day. Um, but I get the sense that uh, for most of our history, it was a way of life because we lived in these little villages with little more than 150 people. And so you knew all their backstories. And so you never had to wonder. And we also, we used to teach the art of storytelling, which is the art of not knowing. And we'd, have, we'd gather in the firelight and tell stories in which some random uh, tr unknown traveler would show up at the, at the door begging for a meal. And we wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the story, uh, it turned out to be a king in disguise, or uh, you know, the trickster coyote, or even your own mother. But as it stands, there are simply too many people there are too many of us uh, for us to stay in Sonder for very long. There's 1.2 billion people in this country alone. And so the only thing we can do is push everyone off into the background um, and, and focus on you. And I think it's, it's, that dilemma is built into the language itself. In English, the, the word for singular you is the same as what it is for plural, as if that distinction didn't matter at all, which is very strange. It's a very basic question. Who are you talking to, you or you? And so every time we use that word, we're basically saying, well, you're all the same. Our challenge is to try to, to look past that, because it's interesting that there is a distinction between I and we, because I is unique. I am distinct. My inner life is bigger. It's different. It's somehow untranslatable to yours. So we do draw that distinction. It's like, and I think that's, that's our only option now. We can't just walk around and saunter all the time. It would, it would be like walking around with, with binoculars and, and trying to get through the day. It would be too much information, too much grit and grain of detail of every, everyone's humanity around you. It would be overwhelming. 
And so what we do is we turn the binoculars around and we magnify our own inner life and turn everyone else so that they look very tiny. So I think that that is our dilemma moving forward, is, is how, how do we see each other? We are all extras, but we are all the main character at the same time. You are the main character, and I am the main character as well. So we are all moving on our own separate paths, each separately, secretly, orbiting the same thing. And so the challenge is, how do we look past that and find a way to see our own humanity? And I think we do that by telling your story. Actually, be present and live your life by definition. Live creatively. Tell your story in full, unabridged, so that there's no question of your own story. And then when you, when you meet someone on the road that you don't know, don't ask them who they are, don't ask them how they, ident they identify, ask them what's your story. And that is Sonder. Thank you.